So we have gathered to take a retrospective view of subaltern studies and to discuss what that series and the ideas underlying it may have bequeathed to us. 30 years have gone by since the first volume of subaltern studies came out in 1981. Ranjit Guha, the founding editor of the series, having taken up in 1980 in his position in what was then the South Asian History section in the Research School of Pacific and Asian Studies at this university. Anthony Lowe, as you've just heard, had invited him to move to Canberra. Guha stopped by in Calcutta on his way to this country, and I was in the city doing research for my ANU doctoral thesis. Guha's visit created quite a stir among the left intellectuals of the city. I had just been to England and spent a few days with Guha in Sussex, discussing the project of subaltern studies in which David Hardiman, David Arnold, two of Anthony's and Ramajit's ex-students, and Shahid Amin and Gyan Pandey from Oxford, then they were Guha's acquaintances um, from Delhi, uh, from 1970 when he spent a year in that city. They were, all, they were already involved in this conversation which was to become subaltern studies. I had carried the exciting news of this new thing called subaltern studies to friends in Calcutta, particularly Gautam Bhadra and Partha Chatterjee, both of whom Guha spent much time with on his way to Australia. And we used to joke amongst ourselves that Guha's ways of, he used to use the word inducting somebody in subaltern studies, was always reminiscent of an old communist party worker <laughs> <laughs> who was going around recruiting uh, future members for the party. Um, so Partha and Gautam also became part of the collective and thus began the journey of the project that looked on itself at first mainly as an intervention in Indian, not even South Asian in those days, history. Of course others joined subaltern studies later, Sumit Sarkar, who also eventually registered strong public disagreement with subaltern studies, Guy Trispivak, Gyan Prakash, Suzy Tharun, Shail Mayaram, Ajay Skaria, and MSS Pandya. 12 or 13 volumes, I forget exactly how many, later, <coughs> the group was formally disbanded in 2008 when we gifted our royalty incomes to the Center for the Study of Developing Societies in Delhi from where Prathama is visiting. <coughs> During its lifetime, the project garnered its share of praise and criticism. But whether or not one agrees with the stated aims of the project, it is perhaps undeniable that subaltern studies and scholarship coming out of it made waves in the world of the social sciences and the humanities generally. <clears throat> the current gathering is itself testimony to the many different and unanticipated ways in which the influence of subaltern studies traveled, truly beyond the confines of South Asian studies. It also says something about the richness of the original project that that members of the founding editorial collective, instead of forming anything like an intellectual monolith, have individually pursued diverse range of questions that both connect back to where we started from and also evolve towards very different futures. Thus, to speak of the original subalterns, Parth Chatterjee's work on nationalism has led him now to explore, in his forthcoming book, Imperial History. David Hardiman's recent work has ranged from Gandhian nonviolence and the turn towards nonviolence from subaltern studies and physical violence, and might I say, to folk forms of healing in South Asia. Shahid Amin has just completed a fascinating study of the legend of Ghazimiya, the Islamic warrior in pre colonial, the legendary and mythical Islamic warrior in pre colonial and colonial India. Gyan Pandey has completed a manuscript comparing subaltern and African American historiographies. Gautam Bhadra has recently been awarded a prestigious prize in Calcutta for his monumental study of the history of Bortala publications, col colonial Calcutta's equivalent of London's Grub Street. While Ranajit Guha, battling ser serious health problems in old age in distant Vienna, has published a series of important and prize-winning books in Bengali, carrying forward both the thesis of old subaltern studies and the anti-history position he had advanced in one of his more recent books, History at the Limits of World History. There are thus many ways of counting time. One way to mark the passage of time is to historicize, and many today will claim that subaltern studies was an expression of its own times, and that recognition 
and that recognition of the changed historical circumstances of the present will no doubt form an element of the conversation we have over the next two days. The story of time's passing is also told, ironically, and somewhat unfortunately for this conference, in our two successively scheduled keynote speakers, Partha Chatterjee and Shahid Amin, not being able to travel for reasons of health. While I'm sure you'll join me in wishing them both robust, in wishing them robust health for years to come, the disappointment itself was for me at least an interesting reminder, if such a reminder was needed, of how important being young was to the project of some of these <laughs> And being young at a very particular historical conjuncture in the late 60s and early 70s of the last century, when students' movements breaking out all over the world brought into being a global Marxism, India's own version being called the Naxalite movement, when civil rights movements and movements for recognition of indigenous people's rights put the language of decolonization to new and creative uses, when the Vietnamese and the Chinese revolutions inspired spirited debates and scholarships on the political and analytical viability of the category peasant, when Western countries facing demographic problems of a shortage of skills opened up to highly skilled immigrants from the erstwhile colonies of the West, when movements were afoot that near our home in Australia would help dismantle the white Australia policy and eventually foster debates on multiculturalism and cultural diversity. Clearly, many of these issues do not strike us today with the same force as they once did, though some, some still command attention. The cult of peasant-based modern and armed revolutions that the Chinese and Vietnamese experiences once inspired in the young has been replaced by talk of globalization, while migrants, asylum seekers, illegal workers, and refugees have emerged perhaps as the new subalterns of the present era. In my recent experience in Delhi looking for real estate for a center that the University of Chicago was to build in Delhi, was that I suddenly looked at the buildings in uh, Gurgaon, new buildings being built where the workers were still working. And suddenly I realized I could read the obscenities they'd written on the walls, because they were all written in Bengal. And I said to people, how come Delhi workers are writing obscenities in Bengal? And of course they said they're all illegal Bangladeshi workers, <laughs> <laughs> working for construction companies in Delhi. Uh, and they are the new subalterns. Gramsci, a key theoretical influence on subaltern studies, is still respected name in many quarters, but he does not seem to occupy the same pedestal as Du Deleuze, Badiou, or even Agamben. Mao Zedong, on the other hand, another key influence on subaltern studies, has suffered a decline in status both globally and within his own country. One could actually ask then, has time rendered subaltern studies invalid? Was the vision of peasant revolution on, on which the pair project was based romantic and utopian? These are legitimate questions, and they've been asked not only by outside observers of subaltern studies, but actually by subaltern scholars themselves. I remember having an exchange of email with Partha Jadaji about two years ago over the argument that the model of peasant insurgency that Guha tried, tried to construct in his book uh, was, in the elementary aspects, was valid for the colonial period but was not helpful for deciphering the nature of peasant and tribal protest against land acquisition for industrial and urban development in contemporary India. Should we then, as Shelley said famously in his letters from Italy, spend our manhood in, unle in unlearning the follies and expiating the mistakes of our youth? Perhaps that advice holds true in the world of action, where unlearning past follies makes but eminent sense. In the domain of ideas, however, it has long seemed to me that something like the opposite holds true. We keep reading or Marx or Weber or Durkheim or Freud, not so much for what they may have been correct about, for those contributions are possibly part of our common sense today, but to understand how and where they went wrong and how we may correct them, if we want to, for contemporary use. It is their mistakes, in other words, that have had a very long life, much longer life than their certitude to them. Not because the mistakes were silly and obvious mistakes, but precisely because they were fascinating and interesting mistakes. Committed because committed because the questions behind them were of fundamental importance to the social science, even if the answers provided were at best controversial and at worst wrong. And I sometimes talking to my my own PhD student, I say you know, aspire to make a very interesting mistake. 
the people who keep coming back to eat. So if unintended, but what I would call generative mistakes, are committed in pursuit of questions that may be termed fundamental, what I would like to do then, by way of initiating a discussion on the global legacy of subaltern studies, is to ask what mistakes of the subaltern studies project could still be considered generative. The examples I'll give, since I'm a historian, will relate to problems encountered in historical thinking. In the interest of time, I will organize my examples of some, about under two sub themes the archaic and the modern, and the subject of history. But I could have expanded on the sub themes of generative mistakes. Uh, I could have picked others, like the religious and the political, the problem of representing the subaltern, or the problem of the archives. But maybe we can touch some, on some of these during QA. Q &A. So, the archaic and the modern, where I think subaltern said is made some very interesting mistakes, generative mistakes, which would require us to go back to read some of them. Let me state the problem here anecdotally and in South Asian terms and then move on to some general considerations. The subcontinent is one part of the world where everyday life is marked by co the cohabitation and intermingling of practices and objects that look both ancient and modern at the same time. A lead machine being carried for delivery on a bullock cart or a push cart was not an uncommon sight in the Calcutta I grew up in. Or if technology has indeed made a difference to such sites, think of how ubiquitous the representation of Quranic, or for that matter, Quranic themes are in everyday life. Uh, Puranas are these Indian mythical stories about gods and goddesses, and with a very lively tradition, uh, actually still exists as a tradition. Again, to use a very common Calcutta example, simply for reasons of familiarity, think of getting into any public vehicle, taxi, bus, or into what they call a minibus, which is a dangerous contraption, so I don't advise you to get into it. You will find pictures hung around the driver's seat that put historical figures, such as the St. Ramakrishna, who lived from 1836-1886, him together with the image of the Puranic goddess like Kali in the same frame. Or maybe the picture of a Sufi shrine and the folk religious saint framed together. In other words, putting humans and gods in the same field of vision is part of popular practices in India. The question is, how should we think about this phenomenon analytically? The problem in turn poses many questions about religion, historical time, about belief and its relationship to practices, about elite and folk religion, and so on. Historians often deal with the problem by speaking of change and continuity, though we seldom know why certain things change while others just continue to. In Indian history, the subject existed until the coming of subaltern studies. We had parceled life out into a neat division of labor. We left matters religious or ancient to Indologists, or historians of ancient India. Matters that needed the historian to know Persian and Arabic fell to the province of the so-called medievalists. And actually, talking about periodization of medievalism, Catherine Kathleen Davis, I'm very glad he's here. She's written a wonderful book on the question of realization as a medievalist. And things pertaining to British rule and after fell to the historian of modern India. And the three groups seldom spoke to each other. As a young Indian and a student of Indian history, I was aware, as I could not be any otherwise, of gods and goddesses or even seemingly ancient practices and sentiments that were part of my Indian life. But that was not something, but that, but which was not something for which I could make any room in my work, except using thoughts like survival, residues, leftovers, that modernization literatures, both of right-wing and Marxist variety, had readily made available. The mismatch between life as described and probed in history, and life as remained, was something that you actually also lived as a historian. My first experience of meeting Guha was something that gave me a jolt on this very particular problem. He invited me to spend a weekend with him at Sussex in 1979. And as a way of introducing me to the incipient subaltern studies project, he read out to me a draft of what later became chapter two of his book, Elementary Aspects of Present Insurgents. I was amazed to find that he was relating oppressive acts and ideologies of rural landlords in 19th century colonial India, to infamous texts of the ancient sage Manu, the Manu Samhita, probably composed around the beginning of the Christian era. So as a historian, I said, how could you put these two together without showing connections? 
First, scholars on colonial India seldom knew Sanskrit texts. But more importantly, how could a historian relate 19th century practices and ideologies to texts separated by thousands of years? On the other hand, I had this strange feeling that these ideologies, however separated they may have been in their historical origins, were not at all unfamiliar to me. That I was already aware that I had been brought up in a society in which they were valued, so that even the 19th century Guha's description melted away before my mind's eye and blended with the India I knew from experience. It left me wondering about his method. More reading and a few conversations later, I realized that what allowed Guha to connect texts separated by centuries and thus deliberately flout some fundamental rules of historical writing was his deep acceptance of French structuralism. So that the underlying proposition was that certain cultural practices could continue to exist long beyond their historical origins by becoming codified through constant repetition and thus entering the structural aspects of a culture. The analyst's job, in Guha's view, was a semiotic one. She or he needed to be able to decode the structure in order to see how the archaic could be alive and well inside the heart of the modern. I was very excited by this discovery. And remember that over the following three months of my stay in the British Isles, while I spent the daytime working in archives and libraries for my thesis, I spent most evenings and weekends in giving myself a course on structuralism and reading a good bit of Levi Strauss, Bolabart, and Rowan Jacobson. The discovery of structuralism was quite a heady experience for us. And Guha was the first scholar to introduce structuralism and the so-called linguistic term into Indian history. But it caused us much problem later, many problems later. Most historians of South Asia were unfamiliar with the literature. Guha had arrived at it via his interest in painting, and some well-known scholars mistook our structuralism for Orientalism of the side in side sense, and accused us of recycling Orientalist themes in a post-colonial garden. I had a first-hand experience of how unfamiliar my Marxist historian friends that Anthony referred to in Delhi were of these continental streams of thought. I came straight to Delhi from the UK to do some more work at the National Archives. One day I got into a scooter rickshaw to visit a reputed some reputed historian friends at the Delhi University. On my way to the university neighborhood, as my scooter was winding its way through the crowded, busy, and bustling neighborhood of Chantni Chok, literally the moonlit square of the walled city of Delhi as it was built by the Mughals in the 17th century, my scooter rickshaw screeched to a halt as a man on a bicycle just happened to come in front of it. And something happened in a minute that worked for me, almost like a structuralist revolution. The man on the bicycle had a bird of prey, a very large falcon, sitting on the back of his left hand. And the driver of, and my driver of the jacked peasant stock, even as he pressed the brake, could not but explain in admiration, as if driven by an invisible cultural compulsion, Shabash, a bravo. Right in the middle of Chamnichok that afternoon, in 1979, the bicycle, the scooter, the modern buildings around, and anything and everything that was not 17th century melted away before my eyes. And I felt transported to the cultural world of Mughal India, where in the middle of the city square, it would have been entirely customary or appropriate for a peasant worker to express admiration for the valor and manhood of a man who was able to tame the falcon, very much a royal symbol of the period. I suddenly felt as though I had watched a bit of Mughal India enacted for me, not as a piece of commercial historical reenactment you might today find in the Red Fort or closer home the former gold fields of Ballarat, but as part of a busy, unselfconscious everyday life. I had just seen a cultural code, I thought, all that Guha had been speaking to me about in Sussex, in action. Structuralism works, I thought. Excitedly, the first thing I spoke to my historian friends about when I got to their place was this incident. And very unexcited by my narration of this revelatory experience <laughs> on my part, they immediately sought to calm my nerves down by telling me that Foucault had somehow gone to my head. <laughs> what could I say? They could not even say it was not Foucault, but Levi Strauss, who was the man corrupting me here. And that Foucault was a rebellion against all that the structuralist tradition might have stood for. That's how unfamiliar historians in India were with anything that happened outside the British tradition in which they'd been reared. 
just to verify that I had not been entirely delusional in my sense of being there, uh, in my sense of there having been a cultural code at play in the event in Chadnichov, I related the incident next day. The friends I'm talking about were uh, immigrants to Delhi from outside of Delhi. They're not original Delhi Wallace. So next day I checked with my friend Nilaji Bhattacharya, a historian at JNU, a Bengali, but who had grown up in Delhi. And I told the story to him, stopping at the point where my scooter rickshaw driver had halted to notice this man with a falcon sitting on his hand. And I asked Nilaji, now what do you think my driver said when he saw this man? And Nilaji correctly guessed, Shabash? And you can imagine how confirmed I felt in my <laughs> structuralist conditions. Well, structuralism may have been the wrong answer. It at least had its own share of methodological problems. But Guha's question was right. And the problem of the archaic in the modern is not just a problem for less developed countries. We face it in many interesting ways in Australia, a nation that often finds interesting substitutes for the medieval or the ancient past it tells itself it does not have. But that's a different story. My second subject is about the subject of Indian history. As many of you would know, subaltern studies began with the aim of making the subaltern the subjects of their own history. In the 1980s, subject was a tricky territory in the 1980s. Rosalind O'Hanlon first pointed out in print that the ostensible subject of subaltern studies seemed unambiguously male. Guy T. Spivak, who began to be active in our discussions around the mid 1980s, not only repeated the charge, she also made the point that our idea of the subject was somewhat naive in the age of post-structuralism and deconstruction. Some of us had made some use of Foucault in the spirit of updating Marx. In fact, it was, it was Guha who introduced me to Foucault as well during those research months in British Isles. But we had no idea of Derrida or Lacan or Deleuze or Guattari or Bataille or any other of the post-structuralist gurus. I remember walking into Guha's office in the Coombs building here in this university one day in the early 1980s, and Guha pointing to a book on the top and the most unreachable part of his bookshelves. It was Derrida's Grammatology in Spivak's translation. Guha and Spivak had already met in Calcutta. He said, have you read this book? I said, no, I have not. He said, I have not either. <laughs> but it's a very important book. <laughs> that was, the conversation did not proceed until Steve Arkansas entered the scene with a epochal question, can the subaltern speak? Deconstruction was not easy to observe. Its linguistic acrobatics alienated many in the group. David Hardiman wrote an important essay once on these divisions. And Sumit Sarkar, taking his departure from the group, wrote a complaining essay entitled The Decline of the Subaltern in Subaltern Studies. Though he blamed it all on the deleterious effect of influence of Edward Sai. And many others of the Indian and international left saw this new turn as giving ammunition to the Hindu right in India. In retrospect, however, we can safely say that Spivak's question has had a long life. A book was published from Columbia recently to celebrate 20 years of the essay. Again, I'm not sure that I'm persuaded by the answer that Spivak gave to her question. One has to remember again also that Spivak's answer itself has been a moving target for her critics because she keeps rewriting this essay. <laughs> <laughs> but there is no doubt that whatever her errors were, they were, in my sense of the term, generated. For they were motivated by a question we cannot escape. In whose voice does the subaltern speak? As Derrida once famously said, voice is no guarantor of presence. But I do not want to pursue here Spivak's line of inquiry. I want to return to the foundational moment of subaltern studies and look for Guha's book, and elementary, and look into Guha's book, elementary aspects of peasant insurgency in colonial India 1983, for the way it posed the question of the subject of history, and by implication, the subject of Indian politics. Obviously, Guha's expectation, born of the 70s discussions of peasant rebellion, then his own involvement in his youth in the Communist Party. So his expectation that the popular insurgencies of the 19th century could be seen as somehow presaging or anticipating a more political popular struggle for the wholesale transformation of Indian social structure in the direction of socialist equality will not seem valid today. But I do think that his, with his careful study of the methods by which peasant crowds mobilize themselves, both in the cities and in the countryside of 19th century India, 
who have gave us the most interesting and creative genealogy of crowd politics actually as it exists in India today. At bottom, Guha asked a question that had been asked in the English context by someone like A.P. Thompson. What role did the people of England play in shaping the English institutions of democracy? That, for example, was an animating question, both in the making of English working class and in the Whigs and Hunters. Guha's question was similar. How did popular politics develop and shape the democracy that India became after independence? But Guha's approach to answering this question, and I would say his answer itself, often implicit in the pages of elementary aspects, were different from what the leftist Anglo historians had divided. Whether it was E.P. Thompson or George Rude, their analysis of rioters, Thompson's analysis of Gordon riots, and Rude's analysis of many riots, including the French Revolution, their analysis of rioters and crowds went in the direction of humanizing the crowd by looking for individual faces in the crowd. And Rude is, of course, famous for this prosopographic approach to crowd studies. There is no doubt about how historiography in general has been enriched by the efforts of these deservedly famous and gifted historians, yet Guha's structure and his answer was significantly different. He did not look to delineate faces in the crowd. For that method only dissolves the crowd into so many individuals, whereas the agency of the crowd is effective and legitimized precisely by its facelessness. And it is facelessness that makes a crowd into an effective political force, or an effective force. Now, how does all this relate to Indian democracy? One of the most interesting ways in which Indian, and some other emerging democracies, such as the South African one, has begun to diverge from liberal Western democracies is in their use of public disorder, and I'm using that word provisionally, as part of political bargaining within a constitutionally democratic structure. A feature that, for instance, distinguishes Indian mainstream political parties for, from their counterparts in the West is that a successful Indian political party has to have the capacity to create mayhem on the streets as a way of publicizing and pushing their demands. This is not required formally or informally of any political party in the West except very rightly or extremely left wing parties, but the mainstream parties don't. Even political movements fighting for rights of particular castes, so those of peasants against land acquisition today, will try to acquire at least a capacity for public violence as a way of advancing their cause. Riotous crowds are an old, established, pre-colonial feature of Indian politics. politics. The words we use in Hindi or Bengali to describe crowd violence, facade, hangama, bulman, and so on, are all figures of disorder, which is apposite for the Mughals and the British rulers after them did treat, the crowd, did treat crowd action only as a problem of order and not as a political problem. The emergence of the crowd as a mainstream political actor begins, of course, under Gandhi, though he was always formally and morally opposed to the violence that often ensued from this. In the early years of the independence, the Prime Minister Nehru and the constitutionalist leader of the formerly untouchable groups, A.B.R. Ambedkar, often reminded the nation that even the Gandhian method of Satyagraha was only suited for fighting the British and should not be deployed against the national government but all this fellow has fallen on deaf ears over the decades. Today, one cannot write off crowd action or more broadly violent politics of the street as simply the disorder of Indian democracy. It is an integral part of how democratic politics are understood and practiced in India. And a new kind of political subject has emerged in India that is demotic and democratic in the sense in which the word democratic is used in India or the meanings, the multiple meanings it's come to have. The peasant insurgencies Guha wrote about were the forerunner of this political subject. And their modes of mobilization are still visible in many of the riots and insurgencies in India today. Guha's hunch that peasants of colonial societies were not pre-political as Hobson had imagined them to be, but rather political, captured something of the spirit of his times. But we did not know very clearly in what sense the word political was meant when we made the claim that the peasant was already political. Guha's answer that these peasant movements could form the basis of a sustained move towards radical social transformation in India has proven wrong. But again, the error, in my sense, was a generative one. Because the question that he was somehow pursuing was right. One day, scholars will return to elementary aspects, not to read the book on Guha's terms, but to find it find in it a way, a method, of constructing a genealogy of the mass political subject in India today.
this would not be the only genealogy, because the very logic of genealogy is multiple, but would be one important way of figuring out how the history of subaltern rebellion has left its imprint on the way that democracy is being shaped in contemporary India. So with those two examples, I'll uh, finish to say that, uh, uh, to return to the theme, that really, leaving a legacy is, I think, about making interesting mistakes. And really interesting mistakes are made when you pursue really interesting questions. Uh, questions that are somehow fundamental. And I think, at least in my life, uh, the main legacy of Sabal, the involvement in subaltern studies was that it gave me the courage, and, and I'm very grateful to Gua for uh, that for that aspect of his mentoring. Gave me the courage to not only ask uh, fundamental questions in an implicit way, which Indian historians did anyway, but to actually bring them to the surface of the discussion and address them. Thank you very much.